Well, hello, and welcome to another edition of the Osteopathic Lyceum podcast. I am going to attempt to make a very basic case or talk about a very basic thing that one would assume in the osteopathic profession that most people are quite aware of. And maybe they are, maybe they aren't. In my personal experience, I think what I'm running into is some degree to which people may not be as aware <clears throat> of the case that I'm going to make as might be ideal. Now, the basic case that I'm going to make is on actual application of technical methods, right? So you could talk about technique application, you could talk about motor skill, but basically this is really about the barrier concept. Now, the barrier concept wasn't necessarily available in a descriptive way early in the profession. So from Dr. Still to the earlier practitioners, you're not necessarily going to identify the term barrier, but you can find early writing about the concept of relaxation and not hurting the patient. Now, from first principles, we can really gather a lot. So when you're trying to get to an outcome, right, if your outcome happens to be increased range of motion for something, by observing how you interact with the person that you're trying to get that for or get that with, you can start to develop a way to describe how to do that most effectively. If you generate pain responses, and that is best identified through audible signals, so, you know, ouch, grunts, whatever. So the person saying ouch, the person making noises that are quite abrupt in response to motion or motion imparted to them by a practitioner. There's also facial expressions, so, you know, squinting faces. Now, the specific faces will be highly variable between individuals and broadly between cultures. So you can't assume that one facial expression is a pain expression and another one is not. You can just note that upon imparting motion to that individual, that there's a sudden change in facial expression. That's a really good cue, a visual cue for a pain response. Then you will also have activation of tissues, right? So uh, specifically muscular tissue. So as you are moving a patient, they become active. Now, it may seem, or you may describe it as they're just helping you. You may describe it as they're pulling away. You may describe it as they're startled or the, the tissue jumps, whatever it is, those three signals. So facial expressions or ch abrupt changes in fa facial expressions, noises that would relate to a pain response in the form of abrupt noises and abrupt activation of muscles would all be signs of pain signals. The barrier concept is one of the best ways we have to describe not engaging those responses, whether you go direct or into the resisted barrier or the restricted barrier, or you go indirect. Now, it is not into the free barrier or the, the unrestricted motion. It is to ease or make the soft tissue soft. That is how you do indirect. Either way, what you're trying to avoid is the pain response. If you identify the pain response, you go indirect. If you can go direct, adding tension to tissue without the pain response, then you're totally fine. Now, in the attempt to add tension to the tissue to go direct, you want to do so short of patient activation. So they shouldn't be activating the tissues. So there's a lot of detail that does not get described well in words about doing that. Now, one of the things that I want to do is Note that, as I said, you can get to this description from first principles or from basic observation of you have an outcome goal of getting something to move better. And you figure out if I do it this way, it does it. If I do it this way, it does not. So I'm going to pull up a screen uh, from an early osteopathic writer. Uh, his name was Ernest Eckford. I believe it's Eckford Tucker. Where is my proper button? Please excuse me. I'm going to pull this up. Okay, so I'll resize here really quickly, resize the screen. For those listening, this is meaningless. So the book, this is available. It is public domain. It's old enough to be public domain. So if you look up e. Ernest Tucker or E.E. E. Tucker or Ernest Eckford Tucker, you will come to the book uh, Osteopathic Technic. Now, Technic is essentially technique or technical skill, technical application. But Technic is really easiest to say today as technique. Now, he was a, so I'll read this description, but he was 
working at the ASO there, or the American School of Osteopathy. So the description on the first page of the book or the internal cover of the book, recently professor of osteopathic principles and technic, American School of Osteopathy, associate editor journal of the American Osteopathic Association, the Osteopathic Physician, the American Osteopathic Magazine, the Herald of Osteopathy, et cetera. So apparently Tucker was doing more than was just written here. This was printed in New York City, and let's see if we can find the date, Ni November of 1917. Okay, so I'm going to go to the location that I want to go to. Uh, the second, I believe it's the second chapter, is Osteopathic Technic, right? So it is just a general overarching discussion. So again, what I'm really pointing to, remember, in that going through this, my aim is to show you how from simple external observation of the patient, you can get to methods that gain or allow you to get to the outcome goal, which is improved motion, be it of soft tissues on tests that are resistance to soft pressure, or resistance to pressure or resistance to yield. No, yield to pressure. I'm messing up my words. Yield to pressure of soft tissues. So as you squish a soft tissue, it either yields or it doesn't. That's how you're testing soft tissues. As far as joint surfaces are concerned, you're usually using gross motion that will identify whether or not all pieces involved are moving as they should. All right, so the da, 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 da. I'm going to very briefly go through some of this and go through some of it in more detail, but the I'll read the start. So numerous are the elements that go into a perfect technique that they would they should be taken up one at a time and woven gradually into the composite sense of technique. Those who leave the osteopathic schools bearing the credentials of the profession take its reputation in their hands. It is the right of those who have labored to build that reputation to insist that those into whose hands they put it shall be sufficiently well-trained in the distinctive osteopathic subjects to be able to uphold and advance the cause of distinctive osteopathy. Now, what I will say is that's just a general no-duh statement. You know, if you're going to be part of a profession, profession, you should be up to standard, and anybody who's already in that profession should feel comfortable saying that we want people up to standard. That discussion becomes highly difficult, mostly because most humans without knowing it are quite constructivist or they believe that the truth is dependent on the their experience, their pre or sorry, dependent on them, their previous experience and their environment of observation. So you'll get a lot of opinions on the exact same topic from people who would be would fall under the same category word. So if you use the category word of osteopathic practitioner, then there's going to be a lot of people with a lot of varied experience, a lot of environments of observation. So those discussions become very difficult, which is where positivism becomes much more appropriate because then what you can do is you can aggregate the data from a bunch of observers, normalize it and find what's consistent, right? That's sort of a tangent that maybe you care for, maybe you don't, but it is very important. So. If we look at Tucker and what he wrote, the first principle of osteopathic technique is not to hurt the patient. That is at all times difficult and sometimes impossible will be admitted since quite some force at times must be used since the structures are held together by high tension. Since in them for their protection, nature has placed nerves that are quite sensitive to any threatening force. So from observation, from the from external observation, you can see that he's talking about protective mechanisms. In today's terms, we would talk about muscle spindles, less so Golgi tendon organs, but we would specifically talk about muscle spindles, at least if we're trying to relate what he observed and explicitly noted to what we understand today. So changes in tension are of a muscle belly are monitored by muscle spindles. At certain points, the muscle spindle will send an afferent signal to lead to alpha motor neuron output, so tightening a muscle to resist lengthening. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's, don't need to read the rest of that. There, I'm trying to point to a theme here. Uh, second principle of osteopathic technique is not to hurt the patient. So we have first principle, don't hurt the patient. Second principle, don't hurt the patient. For an order to cure, it is necessary to hold the patient for every case that is lost to the profession through failure to cure. There are many lost through roughness in handling through pain caused by the treatment. So from the observ, from the, patient experience standpoint if you if the patient feels like they have been treated roughly they feel soreness heavy soreness after a treatment that may be enough to simply turn them away because they don't like the subsequent experience the way that i speak about this in my personal 
practice is I say to patients explicitly or clients, whatever term you prefer, I'd rather you feel nothing than worse. So I'm purposely trying to avoid the pain response because if we generate the pain response today, there's a normal set of responses whereby you will feel sore tomorrow. So again, I'd rather the patient feel nothing than worse. Some of it is informed by historical writing such as this. Some of it is informed by personal experience and then the synthesis of the two leads me to be able to explicitly say that. Other people will like to say it different ways, but basically if you're rough on somebody and they feel sore the next subsequent to the treatment, they can easily attribute it to you and then that can be a simple turn off, right? The third principle of osteopathic technique also is not to hurt the patient. So again, you see this theme, right? No, don't hurt the patient, don't hurt the patient, don't hurt the patient. The success of technique depends on the relaxation of the patient, and this becomes impossible. Fear or mortal reflexes are excited by pain. It was Dr. Harry Still who used to remark facetiously that if a patient could relax sufficiently, he could move any bone any distance. Yeah, so again, uh, just to swing back to that, what was there and do it properly, Success of technique depends on the relaxation of the patient. This becomes impossible if fear or motor reflexes are excited by pain. So again, you see consistent reporting from the external environment of observation and from experience that when you're trying to get something to move, if the person is protecting themselves, so if they're afraid or you move in a way that excites protective reflexes, you're not going to get to the outcome goal that you want, right? So Part of it, you could talk about, if you abstract appropriately, you could talk about building trust in the patient. So if you don't hurt them, they will trust you more. Therefore, they will not feel the requirement to protect themselves. This is not an immediate thing. Sometimes this should take time or should take multiple interactions because the first time that somebody meets you, and this is a stock joke that I have, they shouldn't completely relax. If they completely relax, it might be too easy to kidnap them. So they're too trusting, right? So for the most part, people should have some hesitancy the first time they're interacting with a complete stranger who's going to take control of their body and move them. Over time, what you may experience is that you don't have any requirement to tell the patient to relax. One of my personal pet peeves, be it in people I am helping technically improve their skill set or in practitioners that I'm observing or being treated by, if they ask you to relax, I hate it. It's a major pet peeve. The answer range when you ask somebody to relax is I am, I would if I could, or they just have nothing to say, right? But basically I am, or I would if I could. Instead of telling them to relax, you need to move differently. You need to interface with them differently so that you don't excite the reflexes or the fear that would make them protect themselves. You as the, as the practitioner need to change what you're doing. Don't ask the patient to change. That's a top-down approach. What you're really dealing with is you're imparting movement to them. So it's a sensory first approach. If their fears and their sensations don't match, then they get a better opportunity to not protect themselves. So if their fears, if their top-down fear that something is going to be tender, is matched by how tender you make it, they'll protect themselves. If their top-down fear that something is going to be tender or sore or hurt, and it does not, they can now learn from the difference in expectation and reality, bottom up, the sensation side up, that doesn't hurt, that their top-down control can go away. You need to change as the practitioner what you do instead of making telling the patient to change how they think. That's not the way it's going to work. You need to change how you move. Don't ask them to change how they think because that's not going to work as effectively. So remember, the technical approach, according to early osteopathic writers, including Ernest Eckert Tucker or E.E. E. Tucker or Ernest Tucker, however you'd like to refer to him, is be very cautious in how you're applying so that you don't hurt the patient because you're trying to avoid protective reflexes. Right. Uh, to secure that relaxation is the first art of the practitioner. If there be contractures, then these must be, these of course be relaxed, but the voluntary contractions are always to be obviated. The voluntary contractions are always to be obviated. That means that in, or that doesn't mean, if you're abstracting into experiential practice, then what you can note is that if you move in a particular way, the patient can become active to protect themselves. Therefore, 
do not move that way. Learn how to not move that way. The easiest thing to do is choose a speed at which they don't respond. Too fast, they will respond. Too slow, they will also likely respond. So you need to sort start to experiment with middling speeds. Not too fast, not too slow. Too slow is creepy, too fast. They should protect themselves. That's probably a muscle spindle. Too slow, they should protect themselves because it's creepy. All right. Or I will describe it as creepy. You can disagree. The to repeat the line, the voluntary contractions are always to be obviated. Again, if I'm extracting appropriately into experiential experiential knowledge from practice, from observing many others, that is the fundamental concept. That is very important because if you're going to go direct into the resisted direction or the direction of restriction and the patient activates, they're protecting themselves, then it's not going to work the way you want. If you're going indirect, then the aim is to just completely secure relaxation, make the soft tissue soft in that region. And with whatever set of movements that are required to do that, you want to be organized in how you approach that so you can figure it out most effectively and most accurately. But when you're going direct, they should not contract to protect themselves. It should not be voluntary. So how you move is what allows that to occur. If you move too fast, they'll protect themselves. If you move too slow, they'll protect themselves. So there's a middling set of speeds you have to experiment with. Sometimes you have to go at the speed you think that will work. And when it doesn't, then you have to speed up or slow down. And you would then experiment with that, right? Da -da -da -da. The success of a proper technique is in direct. This I'm reading again. The success of a proper technique is in direct ratio to the success in this. The first, there are mechanical instincts of the body which oppose force with force. Again, if we ex I'm pulling out of the reading and abstracting. If we abstract today's knowledge, this is probably muscle spindle mediated. The mechanical instincts of the body which oppose force with force, probably mechanical. Uh, muscle spindles here, but also top-down control. So psychological or thought-based control, fear-based control is also there because a patient can think they need to protect themselves and they will, or if it's reflex-based, then that is muscle spindle mediated. Reading again, to offset this, the practitioner must endeavor to secure relaxation by gentleness, must win confidence with evidence of care, conspicuous carefulness, impressive caution within the limits of positive and convincing work. This is what I spoke about when I said my personal pet peeve is a practitioner that asks somebody to relax, tells them, let me have it, let go. It's okay. I won't hurt you. Stuff like that. Verbal direction is less likely to work than the actual imparting of movement at an appropriate speed that does not make the, pre the patient protect themselves. Don't ask them to do it. Prove to them that they should relax. Okay. And this is, again, observed from first principles from the external environment of observation with somebody such as Ernest Tucker. You will find some of this in other earlier osteopathic books, depending on what's available, what you can get your hands on. This is just a good distillation of these concepts, and it overlays quite well with what I've experienced and with what I've been able to help others learn to do. The... I'm just going to read again with an assured technique. This is not difficult. It is the bungler who excites the patient's resistance, but often some definite training of the patient's muscles in the art of relaxing is necessary. Right? So here you can abstract with the final sentence, but often some definite training of the patient's muscles in the art of relaxing is necessary because he doesn't specifically say in that sentence whether it is actively requesting the relaxation or proving with movement that they don't need to protect themselves is unclear. My experience is if you ask somebody to relax, again, the answers are I am or I would if I could, right? The, to go back to reading, the fourth principle of osteopathic technique is the same, not to hurt the patient, not to increase his nervous excitement by fear. There is such a thing as disease fear, the fear of sub, the subconscious mind when a state of disease exists in the body. Although sometimes this fear, very fear, enables the patient to yield to and endure things that it would not be possible, impossible to yield to in a state of self-confident health, yet also it may act to magnify the ill results of ungentleness on the part of the operator. The nervous system is always in a state of excitement in disease. The shock of correction may at times be unfavorable. And so again, don't hurt the patient. So we have four principles. Don't hurt the patient, don't hurt the patient, don't hurt the patient. 
all pointing to the way that you do that is in how you impart motion to the patient or corrective motion to the patient. Again, what I will say is too fast. They should protect themselves too slow. They should protect themselves. That middle range of speed and smoothness, nothing abrupt, right? So on and off should not be abrupt. Start and stop should not be abrupt. It should be relatively smooth because it's abruptness, quick changes in length of a muscle or length of a tendon or force on a muscle. So if it's quick enough, you can excite the GTO. The GTO should shut the muscle down. And that would be the argument of people who use thrust-based things. It's if I go fast enough, the muscle should shut down. I should be able to blow through it. Whereas in osteopathic practice worldwide, where the regulations surrounding the practice of osteopathy are highly variable, thrust is okay in some jurisdictions. It is not okay in others. So if you go back to the omnipresent thing where a jurisdiction doesn't matter, no thrust, don't thrust things. Then you can talk about these medium speeds and the medium speeds and either abrupt off or on should excite either the GTO or the muscle spindle. Scroll down, no, nothing else there. Uh, so I'm gonna stop the share here and pull out from the written stuff just to show that early on in the profession, this also overlays the claims that I make quite often, that the work of osteopathy is often quite good, but the claims have problems. Claims like that from the external environment of observation, just talking about keep the patient relaxed, don't hurt the patient, don't hurt the patient, don't hurt the patient, in order to secure relaxation so you can impart corrective movement. That is about as solid as it gets, and it doesn't necessarily require any mechanisms to be understood because you don't have to know the mechanism to observe that a mechanism has been engaged. Those mechanisms would be voluntary contraction or reflex contraction. Voluntary contraction would be top down. They're protecting themselves because of something you're saying, something you're doing, how you are moving. And then the abrupt change in or abrupt impartation of movement that generates some response would be reflexive, right? So you can separate your categories on observation, whether or not that's exactly how they work out doesn't matter. But what you can figure out from an observing the attempt to impart movement to somebody and then have that range of motion change as a result of that attempt, you can figure out that if you're smooth, you'll get the result. If the patient, if you move in a way where the patient's muscles turn on, they activate, whether reflexively or consciously, so protectively, or protect consciously protective, however you want to term that, that you don't get the result that you're looking for. So avoiding pain responses is central to securing relaxation, building trust, especially over time. As I noted, the first time that you interact with somebody, they shouldn't fully relax or they shouldn't want to fully relax. It's very common for them to have some hesitation, trepidation. The way that you build that trust is by moving smoothly. So nothing too fast to start, too fast to finish, right? So you don't move like this, then that, right? So smooth, right? Smooth in and then fast out. Nothing like that. Just should be smooth, smooth, right? So no abrupt start and end points, just nice and smooth. So if you look at some groups of osteopathic practitioners, because there's lots of subcategories, uh, you'll hear rate, rhythm, and repetition, right? Rate, rhythm, and repetition does refer to smoothness, right? So if you are smooth, everything is going to probably work out okay, even if you're not accurate. But the smoothness at least allows you to avoid protective responses. If you can avoid protective responses, you can often change the tone of tissues. You can often change the range of motion of whatever structure you're thinking about, talking about, working on, because you don't engage those protective responses. Because you don't engage those protective responses, you also don't have the normal set of outcomes in order of engaging protective responses, right? So a way that I will often explain this is that if you are playing a sport, somebody gives you a knee to the thigh, you'll, it won't feel good, but you'll finish the game, you'll be okay. And then the next day you'll be quite sore, right? So the short-term effect is nothing. The longer term effect or the next day effect is that you're sore. This is very, very normal with hands-on therapeutics of all kinds. People are often sore subsequent to the treatment. Whereas with osteopathic practice, the thing that really, really differentiates it from any other hands-on practice is the barrier concept. The barrier concept is the best explanation that we have of what I call the heuristic, don't make the patient say, ouch. 
We see this in early osteopath osteopathic writing in the form of Ernest Eckford Tucker, who was teaching at the American School of Osteopathy, the first school of osteopathy, and he was saying, don't hurt the patient. And he was talking primarily if we abstract appropriately, and maybe we're abstracting inappropriately, but don't, if you hurt the patient, then you lose trust and you won't get the outcome that you want. So again, if we abstract appropriately through experience over time, smooth movement where the patient's reflexes to protect themselves are not ex excited either consciously or in pure reflex via muscle spindles. So if you move smooth, you avoid it. Right? So when I talk about how you apply the barrier concept, be it direct or indirect, if you're going to go into restriction, the patient's muscles should not contract. That's one of the easiest ways to figure out if you're doing it appropriately is if they jump or if they hold or if they resist. If they resist, you've lost it, you just have to change how you're doing it. You have to work with something like decreasing the amount of tension that you're putting on, decreasing range of motion, decreasing how much pressure with your fixed point or your monitoring hand that you're putting on a soft tissue. You have to change a few variables to avoid that activation. Once you avoid that activation, you'll be able to get something. With going indirect, you simply make the soft tissue soft in an organized fashion or as soft as you can. But it doesn't mean the patient can't be active. One of the reasons I talk about with patient active approaches is I don't like to activate the region that I'm working on. I like to use the concept of relational motion. So one thing stays still, one thing moves in relation to it. So if I was working on the neck, I may turn the neck and then have them turn the torso instead of turning the neck itself. Or I may have them keep the head straight and turn the torso, right? So if you look at my chin, for those listening, my chin is in the middle at this point. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring my left shoulder forward, my left, my right shoulder backwards, which means in a relative sense, my chin has gotten closer to my left shoulder. So we can call it left rotation. Or if I turn my head to the left into restriction, right? So, and then I bring my left shoulder forward and my right shoulder back. Now my chin has gotten closer to my shoulder. Therefore, in a relational sense, I have gotten more left rotation. But I've done this without activating the neck, without activating the muscles that are probably stiff, probably sore, are probably going to respond negatively to actively contracting. So if we extend the concept of do not hurt the patient, do not excite those reflexes, if you work patient active and you have them turn on the muscles that you're working on, it's much more likely they're going to feel uncomfortable and have a meaningful reason to be concerned about how they're going to feel. Whereas if you hold one thing steady or turn one thing one way and then move something in relation to it, right? So if we use the neck as the example, I turn the torso instead of turning the neck, right? Activate the torso instead of activating the neck. The neck is not going to feel it much and the torso isn't going to aggravate the neck, right? So the active motion of the torso won't aggravate the neck, which is why in patient active approaches, I advocate for not activating the area that you're working on. Activate something else, especially on a table. When they push into the table one way or the other, you'll have relational motion. So they may not get a lot of motion, but the thing that pushes into the table will move in relation to the thing that you're holding still, right? So you'll get some motion in some way and you essentially test one movement versus another to get more of what you want. Right. But you're not going to activate the area that you're working on because you're trying to keep it as comfortable as possible because you're trying not to pay, make the patient say, ouch. So an effective interpretation of using what Ernest Tucker wrote and using the barrier concept and avoiding active contraction of the region you're working on is to not contract it during patient active approaches. So in total, the thing to take away from this is the barrier concept is the central thing that makes osteopathy different from any other hands-on profession. And the way to know that you're using the barrier concept appropriately is that there is no activation of the region that you're working on by the patient, whether you're going into the restriction or going to make all of the tissue soft by going indirect, that there is no activation in that region. The patient doesn't activate to protect themselves for any reason. That's how you know whether you're going to restriction or ease that you're doing what you want to do. You want to avoid the patient active activation to protect the area you're working on. So again, lots of words for what many might consider a fairly basic conversation. However, I think it's exceptionally important to build that up from first principles and 
point out how osteopathy might have built this approach from the external environment of observation without needing to know the exact mechanism that was happening because you can observe it from the external environment of observation. You can have the outcome goal that you want, which is increased range of motion in the patient, and you can figure out how to do it most effectively by trying multiple ways. And in doing that over time, you figure out that being abrupt or moving in any way that allows the patient to protect themselves or feel the need to protect themselves and then activate, you will be further away from your goal of altering motion in the region. So again, fairly basic conversation. Might be obvious that people should know this through observation. I'm not convinced that everybody that falls under the category of osteopathic venue practitioner does know this. Therefore, I think at least there's some value in putting it out and also supporting it from the historical perspective to say that we don't need to know the mechanisms. We can observe the behavior in that rough sense from the external environment of observation and behave appropriately to get the outcomes that we want such that the discussions about what is happening in environments that we can't observe appropriately, aka internal environments, are of less concern than how we behave on a motor sense or on a movement sense as the practitioner. And so again, hopefully you gain something from that and I'll talk to you again soon.